Welcome to the Pittsburgh Gal Principal Podcast, where women school leaders and teachers come to share their school and classroom stories about teaching, learning, and leading. If you are a woman leader or teacher, I would love to have you on the show and share your story. Please connect with me on Twitter at eclaire underscore ahs or following my blog at pittsburghgalprincipal.wordpress.com. This is episode 16 of the Pittsburgh Gal Principal. Today I am talking to Jennifer Klein. Please enjoy the chat. Good evening, everybody. Um, or actually, it's the afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I am excited today to be chatting with Jennifer Klein. She is the founder and CEO of Principled Learning Strategies, as well as an author, speaker, facilitator, and coach. Jennifer, um, how, how's it going today? It's going beautifully. Thank you. We've got a gorgeous day and uh, beautiful weather here in Denver today. Okay, cool. Um, Pennsylvania is finally cooling off a little bit, so we're starting to get nice weather as we gear up for the freezing cold. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Jennifer, can we just start, uh, the conversation with you sharing with our listeners, um, what you're doing now, as well as some of of the other positions that you've held in the past? Absolutely. Well, I, I spent 19 years in the classroom, so I spent the majority of that career in the high school English classroom, creative writing and core English, um, and I did that work in Central America as well as in the Denver area. Um, but six, uh, actually going on seven years ago now, close or six and a half years now, um, I left teaching to start doing consulting work. So my goal was to do professional development with teachers in a way that was more meaningful and effective than a lot of the professional development that I had experienced myself as a teacher. Um, I think most educators know that you you get the whole gamut, right, in terms of the quality of professional development. And I really wanted to do something different that would engage teachers in a deeper way, inspire them to think differently about their practice. So I focused most of all on global educational strategies and project-based learning or other student-centered strategies um, in an effort to really get kids more in charge of their own learning, um, Um, to make the classroom a more engaging place and to build some of the competencies that kids need to really not just survive in the the world that they'll be graduating out into, but really thrive within that uh, world that we can't even necessarily predict one day to the next. Okay, wow. That's awesome. So you taught English in Central America. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I was in. I lived in Costa Rica from 1994 to the end of 98. Um, so I spent about three years of that time teaching in classrooms there. I was in international schools, um, but I landed in a pretty interesting uh, situation because I landed in a school called the Lincoln School, which is um, one of the most prestigious of the independent schools in Costa Rica, um, but is actually predominantly Costa Rican in its student body. So it's different from your average embassy school in the sense that you really have local students as opposed to international students. And that was where I had this sort of awakening actually about what was possible through the classroom. Um, I had this realization actually because I had the son of the Costa Rican president, Oscar Arias, um, who is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. I had his son, Oscar, in my English classroom, my 10th grade English class when I was uh, my first year teaching high school, if you can imagine, in 1995, that would have been. Um, And, uh, you know, I just had this huge realization about what was possible. If I had the child of a president sitting in that room, then I had this opportunity to help create more open minds and more of the the capacities that would help to make the world a better place um, and potentially help to craft some, you know, new leaders with new ways of thinking about their role and their responsibilities to others. Um, So that was really my awakening point as an educator, for sure, in those years. Wow, that sounds like a lot of pressure. Did you feel pressure (laughs) having having that student in your classroom? Well, Oscar didn't, certainly was one of the sweetest uh, students I've ever had, so he didn't create any pressure, no, but <clears throat> pardon me, I had um, I had three or four other children of, of uh, diplomats and um, minister of education and, you know, uh, pr- other presidents as well. Um, one of my students, her father became the, the sitting president while she was in my class. Um, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, w- I would say there's some pressure that comes with that, um, but that was also part of 
the responsibility that I wanted students to understand was that when you've been given an opportunity, when you can look at your own life and recognize there are certain privileges or advantages that I've been born with, whatever those might be, whether they're economic or geographic or, you know, who knows what, um, that, that that comes with a sense of responsibility. And so I realized that I had that position of privilege in the sense that I had the opportunity to work with these young people who would create change in the future. Um, and and I lived by that responsibility. And actually, I can share that one of the one of the coolest stories of the year for me, actually, is that one of my alums just began a watershed renewal project in San Jose in Costa Rica um, that's going to be huge. They're basically turning all of these abandoned watersheds that are, you know, trash-filled rivers and crime-filled areas, uh, they're turning them all into walking and biking paths to create ways for people to get around um, the whole capital district without a car uh, and to do so safely in a beautiful environment. And that's, you know, that's a young person who I taught when he was 15 at his formative age, who's now going on to do really significant work to improve improve his community. Oh my gosh, yeah. Now that now that you share that story and I thought I think about the comment I just made to you about it, you know, if you felt pressure, we really should feel pressure just in general because yeah. we are working with kids like you described in their formative years and yep. really trying to create citizens that are going to contribute to the world in a positive way. Absolutely. If anything, I think I feel pressure, but my sense of inspiration and passion is so deep that I feel that more strongly. <laughs> uh, it's so clear to me that every child in that classroom, any child in any classroom, is potentially that young person who will go on to create something new that makes the world a better place, even if it's only in a tiny way for one community. Um, but it's still important. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know a lot about the, uh, or anything really, if I'm being honest, about the uh, school system in Central America. Can you share a little bit about that? Um, well, insofar as I know, yeah, sure. Um, I, I, To be honest with you, I spent most of my time inside of international schools, which are the private school system, you know, so it's it's outside of the norm. Um, in my experiences in, um, in Costa Rica in particular, the Costa Rican system includes some pretty great schools. They've done a, a nice job of... Um, uh, integrating bilingual education into the public system in some meaningful ways, um, which I think is pretty impressive. They still have some challenges, though, in terms of um, getting technology and high-quality teachers out into rural areas. Uh, that remains a problem, I think, across Central America, just as it does in much of the world. You know, your, your high-quality teachers tend to want to stay where there are higher salaries and, and better living conditions, which is often in the cities. Um, and so it's hard to coax the best out into the countryside um, one of the things that a lot of the Costa Rican public school teachers deal with is what's called double turns. So they basically have a, um, and it would be like doble turno in Spanish, they have two shifts for the school day. Oh. Um, so for example, and the teacher teaches both. So this is probably going to horrify you slightly, Emily, but the, <laughs> um, the teachers teach both shifts. So they start their day usually with a 7.30 a.m. class that ends just after lunch, um, and then they start a set a whole different grade level just after lunch until 5 or 5 30 6 o'clock so they put in a ridiculously long day um, and all teachers are responsible for two different grade levels so I might teach first grade all morning and then fifth grade all afternoon um, it's a pretty funky system <laughs> and, and wow. definitely really exhausting for the teachers yeah well I'm a high school principal so nothing really horrifies me yeah. anymore but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so um Tell me more about your consulting work and this idea that you wanted to make professional development more relevant. Absolutely. Well, so when I first left the classroom, I um, one of the first organizations that I connected with was an organization out of Colorado called the World Leadership School. And World Leadership School does programs in the developing world for young people, um, uh, experiences for them to really immerse themselves in different parts of the world. And when they uh, when I encountered them, they were looking to expand their professional development offerings. Um, and so that was the first place I hung my hat. Um, from there, I also connected myself with um, the Buck. Institute for Education, which is a leader in project-based learning um, and how to prepare teachers for that kind of work. I also aligned myself with Taking It Global, a small nonprofit out of Toronto doing global educational work. Um, and most recently, I started working with Asia Society as well. 
Um, I, mostly because I feel like I have a lot I can learn from them about global competency development and assessment. Um, they've been doing some really extraordinary work for a long time now in the field of global education. So, so sometimes it sounds a little bit like I'm schizophrenic because I'm working under so many different hats. Um, but I think for me, what's been really powerful about it is that I can approach things in such different and creative ways depending on what school I'm in and what organization I'm representing. I think the, the best of professional development for teachers tends to be, um, as you I, you used a perfect word for it, which is relevant, right? Um, do we get a chance, for example, to do something with the ideas in the course of that professional development workshop? Um, I think most of the time what teachers feel is that they get lots of good ideas from a good pr uh, professional development presenter, but they don't necessarily get a chance to do anything with them, meaning that they walk away going, well, now when do I have the time to implement all of this cool stuff that I just learned, <laughs> you know, uh, which can be really challenging. Um, so I think part of it is about developing workshops that are more interactive, where teachers are really getting something planned that they can implement immediately. Um, another piece of it, I think, too, though, is the individualized needs. Um, and so one of the other areas that I've been doing a lot of work around is virtual consulting or virtual coaching, um, meaning that um, regardless of where the school is located, I can work really directly with teachers who have specific needs or plans and want some one-on-one -on -one assistance. Uh, the biggest complaint that I hear from teachers about professional development is that it's not always relevant enough for them. You know, so if you've got a K-12 audience, for example, you know, your kindergarten teachers aren't going to feel that anything high school is relevant to them and vice versa. And I don't think that that they're right to say that. I mean, I think a good presenter can help um, create some really powerful cross-pollination across those divisions in, in any school. Um, but I also think that teachers are hungry for that chance to sit down with somebody more directly and do more individualized work, you know, really work on, you know, here's my project. Don't to talk to me in big, broad swaths. Talk to me about my ideas and how to make them most effective. Yeah. Um, so this idea of virtual coaching have you ever like um, skyped with a teacher and watched their class and then talked about them after talked with them afterwards, or is it more been like planning sessions, or what does that it's, look like? Yeah, it's been much more planning sessions. But you just brought up something that I would love to be able to do more of. Um, I think the uh, technology opens the door to so many possibilities, and I just haven't had that request from a teacher now. You know, right up to to date, basically what I'm doing is catering the professional development pretty specifically to the needs of the teacher. And so if the teacher doesn't say, oh, I want you to watch me teach, then I'm not necessarily going to bring it up. But um, but it is something I've been thinking a lot about, the, the opportunity to kind of be you know, um, eyes on the wall, if you will, right? Um, watching the classroom and being able to really give uh, the teacher some feedback afterwards. I think that's, there's certainly a lot of powerful possibility with that. Um, the challenge, of course, is that we all behave differently when there's a camera on in the room, you know? Um, and I know you know that as a principal as well. As soon as you walk in the classroom or as soon as the teacher knows you're coming, um, you know, they can put on a pretty impressive song and dance. <clears throat> Pardon me. But uh, so if it's general evaluation, I'm not sure it would work as effectively. Actively, but if a teacher is trying something new and wants, you know, I'm going to try this launch event, I want, you know, some feedback on what is and isn't working for next time, I could see it being a very powerful tool for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was meeting with uh, one of my new teachers earlier this week and she said, well, you know, I can't see myself teach. And I said, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> yes, you can. Yep, yep. You can video yourself and I highly recommend it. It's not easy absolutely. to watch, but it's an important, you know, important thing to do. So you talked well, a lot about... That's, that's really well put, too. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think you're right. I think it's it's not easy to watch. My father actually uses that strategy as a cello teacher. Okay. Um, because so often students don't recognize that a tiny little angle of the elbow or the wrist can make all the difference in the strength of the sound that they produce. And so being able to see themselves, you know, playing makes a huge, huge difference. And I think it applies to just about anything, but teachers very rarely think of themselves as people who need to watch themselves teach for that purpose. Right. And, and it should happen lots more often than it does. Absolutely. It should. So you talked a lot about global education. Mm -hmm. What does that, in your, from your um, perspective, what does that look like in a school? That's a great question. I think it's going to look really different in every school. Um, and I, what I'm finding it, actually in the research that I did for the book that I have coming out next year, um, 
on on that that book will be on global yeah. partnerships <clears throat> pardon me in particular so not just global education in general but how to develop partner collaborative learning partnerships between classrooms how to find speakers uh to Skype into the classroom that kind of thing oh, cool. um so it's going to, it, you know, it's going to look really different in every place. You know, uh, there's an example for, ex uh, with, uh, Washington DC public schools, for example, has about two or three years now under their belt doing global programming across all of their district. Um, in their case, they've been focusing most of their efforts on, um, creating equity so that every single student who wants to has an opportunity to travel abroad during high school. Oh, wow. Um, and they've also been very successful with an embassy program. It's a, a, one of their oldest programs actually in the district where, um, because they're in DC and all of the embassies are there, they do uh, a ton of sort of partnering a, a given embassy with a given school um, and so for outreach and for connecting um, connecting and all that kind of stuff um, so it you know it looks one way in that demographic and in that set of circumstances, if you walk into an independent school, uh, you might see even more student travel, maybe a little bit less focus on equity. I think that's something that the private schools are really still struggling with, is how to make sure that all students have access to travel um, uh, experiences of one kind or another that are, you know, high quality. Um, in in the Asia Society network of schools, those are predominantly uh public schools. So it's called the International Studies Schools Network. And what they've been able to do is uh, basically support um, public schools across the country that are trying to bring global issues and perspectives into their classroom. Um, and the way that they've set up the framework, and, and I like their way of thinking about it, is that every classroom experience should include opportunities for students to investigate the world, to recognize different perspectives on the issues they're encountering, um, to communicate the ideas that are emerging for them about the world and their place in it, and to take action on the issues that matter to them. And if you think of those four domains as kind of the heart of what it means for a classroom to go global, it can look a whole lot of different ways, right? It could be as simple as my students, you know, grappling with a global issue themselves inside the classroom or grappling with it in collaboration with another classroom. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, uh, gathering lots and lots of different perspectives on one one issue or topic uh, to try to understand, you know, how reality is different for different people because of their experiences. Uh, it's really going to vary. And I'm a lot of schools, the high school level, especially we're starting to see these great um, uh, global diplomas uh, being worked in in a lot of schools where you get a, you know, special commendation on your diploma for the global scholars program or whatever it might be. But there's some sort of a capstone experience in your senior year where you synthesize some of the global experiences you've had, whether those have been travel or in your classrooms, um, do some sort of a major presentation about your, your plans for the future. You know, some schools have a whole five-year action plan as a global leader. It really varies from school to school. But um, some pretty cool stuff being done um, by both public and private schools in the U.S. Sure, absolutely. So if I'm an individual classroom teacher and I recognize the need for my students to um, collaborate and, and talk to people that are outside of my school, um, what, do, what would you suggest in terms of resources or next steps? Like what's one um, thing that a, a classroom teacher can do or one place that they could go to try to figure out how to do that? Absolutely. Well, there are a lot of places to go. So it's, it's a, a interestingly challenging to narrow it down to just one or two. Um, I think, you know, there are a couple of major organizations that are known as sort of the, the leaders when it comes to the partnering and project kind of work. Um, and iron is probably the easiest example um, of a long standing organization that's done really good work around that. So that's I E A R N. Dot org, the International Education and Resource Network. Um, they're an international organization with offices all over the world uh, doing global educational connecting and collaborating and creating projects and um, just doing some really cool stuff. So that's an easy way to get started if teachers are looking to collaborate. Um, the other network that's really extraordinary is the Global Education Conference Network. Um, and the Global Education Conference, or Global EdCon, takes place every um, November. 
Uh, it's a 100% virtual online conference, so it's 100% free um, to any teacher in the world as long as they have internet access. And um, it's just a, it's a pretty extraordinary event. I mean, the two people who run the Global Education Conference Network are Lucy Gray and Steve Hargaden, and they're actually today is Global Collaboration Day. Um, they are they lead events throughout the year, including today, um, which include usually a combination of in-person and online experiences for teachers. Um, but basically joining their network, um, they've got a Ning, um, which is how they run the conference, but also how they share news. Um, and it's a way that you can connect with uh, thousands of different educators around the world. Uh, so it's a pretty extraordinary network. I would say that as a starting place, that would be a great place to start. Okay, wow. Yeah, I think I saw something about Global EdCon on Twitter, probably. Yeah. Um, so let's let's shift the conversation a little bit. I mean, it's related, but let's talk about project-based learning. Sure. Why do you believe, or do you believe, that project-based learning is more than just a fad? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it, and thank you for asking it that way, too. I really appreciate that. Um Part of why I know it's not a fad, actually, is because I was raised on something really similar um, in the 70s and 80s before we had all these separate acronyms for all the different educational movements. <laughs> we do um, like and we, acronyms, don't we? We love our acronyms. Um, we, you know, the umbrella of experiential learning... Um, which was also for a long time connected to the democratic school movement, produced some pretty extraordinary alternative schools in the early 70s. And I was fortunate enough to go to um, one of those schools um, and graduated from, it's it's the Jefferson County Open High School, uh, Open School, pardon me, or Open Living School, it used to be called here in Colorado. Um, and so to be honest with you, I know it's not a fad because I know it's been around since the 70s. We've just had lots of different names for it. Um, I think what we're talking about in, at the heart of it all is getting students at the heart of, of their learning experience. Um, in a lot of ways, I, I actually think inquiry-based is often an easier way for people to think about it okay. um, because I think project-based often brings to mind that idea of producing something tangible, and it's not necessarily always the case that kids would produce something tangible. You know, I think what what we're really getting at is, is young people um, thinking for themselves a bit more and problem-solving, and I do think that students student-centered learning is a really important antidote to kind of balance this testing frenzy that we've gotten into in the United States. Um, I think students do significantly better on tests when the learning that they've done is relevant and deep and they've had some ownership over it. And there's been so much good research to show that even something as simple as voice and choice um, really makes a difference, not just in how happy kids are, but in how much they achieve. Um, so their test scores go up, their AP scores go up, you know, all of those things when they have a more a more authentic opportunity. Um, so, so I don't think it's going to go away. I do think that for it to really continue to take hold and be effective, I think the universities need to start to shift as well. Um, and I'm seeing some good signs that they are. Uh, there are more and more university professors looking for ways to make sure that their courses are uh, participant driven, if you will, or student driven, um, that students are not just sitting in rows, listening to lectures and taking notes, but are really engaging with the ideas and, and information. Um, and to be honest with you, I just don't think that we create that, ne you know, that next generation of global leaders that I was talking about earlier, those young people who see a problem and come up with a creative new way to solve them, that's just not going to happen through a sit and get methodology. You know, if all we're asking kids to do is memorize the past, um, how much does that really prepare them to create a different future? You know, so from my perspective, it's a balance of both. They need to understand the past and they need to think for themselves about what's possible in the future. Um, and I think working on those problem solving skills is really the heart of project based learning, problem based, play based, you know, whatever acronym you want to use, um, even design thinking and all of those um, can easily uh, have that same impact on kids in terms of increasing engagement and motivation um, and then also really foster those problem solving skills. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the university level because um, oftentimes I hear from high school teachers, yes, PBL's great and all, but my kids are, you know, my students are going off to college and I need to prepare them for what they can expect there. Right. And, you know, and oftentimes, especially at larger universities, they are in, you know, a class of 400, if you will, and it's a sit and get right. environment. What is, what is your um, comment back to anybody who says that? <laughs> 
Well, I, the first thing that I would say is I really, really hope that the universities with that mindset start to see their enrollment go down. I think that the new graduate of this this sort of new high school, the ne the next generation high school that I know that, you know many schools across the country are trying to envision and create. Um, I hope that they will demand something different from their universities. You know what I mean? I, I hope that to some degree it'll happen just through you know, stu students making different choices about where they want to go for university as a result of that. And, and I realize that there are some economics behind the capacity to make choices like that. So that that by itself probably won't solve the problem for everybody. But I do think that um, that students themselves will start to gravitate toward the schools that are doing more of this, especially if they've had these experiences and know that it works better for them. Um, in it, the other piece, I guess, that I would say to those people is that just because the university system is set up that way doesn't mean that the entire education a student receives before college should be geared toward those four years of test taking in college. It's kind of like the if they're going to be miserable for four years, we might as well make sure that they do it for 18 years before that kind of an <laughs> argument. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't quite <laughs> doesn't quite resonate for me as a strong argument. Um, I think that kids I think, for example, that young people can become good test takers, not by taking them so constantly, but by having, you know, intentional practice doing so. Um, and the reality is that when they finish college, that'll probably be the last time that they take a multiple choice test, or if they do ever again, it'll be very, very rare in the course of their lives, you know. So I think that um, the assumption that we're preparing kids for college sometimes forgets that we're actually preparing kids for life beyond college. Um, and life beyond college has very little of that sort of rote test taking. Right, exactly. Now, you brought up next generation high schools, and I was actually just at the White House on Monday. Oh, nice. For, yeah, it was great for a summit about next generation high school. And something I've been wondering about um, before I went, but even more so after, is, you know, one of the... I guess the premises or the principles that Next Generation High School is trying to push is this idea that more students need to take more AP courses. And mm. so I wonder about that because what I often see is a lot of content coverage in an yeah. AP course, Agreed. kind of whizzing through the entire textbook instead of, you know, pushing for deeper understanding. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are um, if, if you want, if you're willing to share about the advanced absolutely. placement courses. Yeah, absolutely. And I do have strong opinions, but I'm also pretty unapologetic about those opinions. So, you know, I don't mind, I don't mind sharing what I think. All um, right, rock on, Jennifer. <laughs> I like that attitude. <laughs> well, I figure that if somebody doesn't like my views, I don't want them to hire me anyway, probably, unless they, <laughs> want push, unless they want me to push their community. I would rather, you know what I mean? Like, I'd rather that people came to me because of the, the way that I see things, not in spite of. So, um, so yeah, I have pretty strong opinions about it, the AP courses. I think that they improved several years ago. I know that they made some pretty major revisions to the courses and to the exams and I and I've had um enough, you know, thoughtful I want to use the word argument, but in a friendly way. I've, I've had enough thoughtful arguments with friends who teach AP um, to know that I can't just slam it and say that there's no value to the course. Um, but I have seen some really, really cool things happen in schools that have gotten rid of the AP as well. Um, and Berkeley Carroll School in Brooklyn and Park Slope is a really interesting example of this. this. They were really one of the first schools that I encountered anyway that managed to get rid of the AP courses and instead replace them with um, their own version of what honors level work looks like, um, high, high level work looks like, because they recognize that the APs were causing a lack of choice um, and voice for students in their senior and junior and senior years, um, that basically, depending on the college they wanted to go to, they had to fill their schedules with a certain amount of, um, or number of AP courses um, uh, for those GPAs that they wanted for those universities. And the school just hit this wall and said, you know what, we're not comfortable with the fact that AP is now deciding the whole course 
load <laughs> um, and who gets in where, and we're just going to step away from it completely. Um, and one of the things that their principal said to me was that she um, actually had more trouble convincing the teachers than the parents to make that shift, which I thought was a really interesting insight, um, that the parents just wanted assurances that their kids would still get into the same colleges, that yep. this was going to hurt their college admission. But once they were reassured of that, they sort of went about their business and were completely fine with it um, and understood and trusted the school, you know, but the teachers had a hard time because they were used to being told what good looked like, you know, right. uh, for lack of a better way to put that. Um, and so they had to craft, craft their own courses. And I mean, it's been several years now. They're, they're teaching some extraordinary, extraordinary stuff at Berkeley Carroll. And they have some really unusual high school courses because they've untied their hands um, and asked their teachers to be creative and have really supported their teachers in, in creating those new courses. So, so I have mixed feelings. I, I kind of wish that the you know that the APs and the college board and all of these things weren't quite so interconnected. I I'm a bit suspicious sometimes about the way this big machine works, um, and and you know the extent to which these decisions are being made by educators as opposed to people who um, have something to sell. Um, but I I do believe that high level high quality work is important certainly to see, um, and so in that regard. I mean, I think the challenge for schools nowadays is to nowadays is to figure out that balance between the traditional and the and the more progressive. Um, and I know that there's a, I don't know if you're familiar with the knowledge in action um, program. Uh, it was a research project that was done. I think it's probably going on seven or eight years ago now. They just uh, revived it actually this year, so there will be some new findings coming out soon. But the original Knowledge in Action project was basically to rewrite two AP courses in PBL style oh, cool. to see what the returns might look like, and the returns were very positive. Um, and they tested it out in um, sub, you know affluent suburban neighborhoods, and they also tested it out in inner city, um, not so affluent neighborhoods. Um, um, and uh, I found very similar results in both uh, that that particularly and I thought this was really notable and then I'll stop talking but um, particularly they found that um, the students who had done their AP coursework in a student-centered style were significantly better on the test when it came to complex scenarios. Hmm. And I, th I think that by itself is really telling because that suggests that the learning transferred to different complex situations. And I think that's what we would hope for more than good test scores as educators, right? That kids can really take what we've what they've learned with us um, and apply it in a wide array of different situations in different ways. Okay. Do you know which course? You said there were two AP courses that were rewritten. Yeah. In the PB which ones were they? Yeah, the first round at least was AP U.S. Government and AP Environmental Science. Okay. Um, and you can find a lot of information on Edutopia. There's a, um, a whole tab for just for knowledge in action that can lead you to the research as well as videos and, and all sorts of different uh, findings. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. So obviously you are you seem pretty connected and and pretty not I mean very knowledgeable on <laughs> thank you um, you know global education and project based learning so if what are what are some recommendations um, from you Jennifer because our school district is going through what we're calling ex, um, exploring innovation and we're taking this whole year to really think critically about what we do as a school system and trying to figure out how we want to change that for next school year and, and not knowing that we're not going to be where we want to be next school year, but just make some, mm -hmm. some small shifts. So one of the things that we're doing as a school district is we're going and, and we're going to make some school visits. Mm -hmm. um, and our superintendent has, you know, put some finances aside so that we can do that. What would what recommendations do you have of places that yes you have to see this <laughs> now knowing that I'm at a high school level I'm most interested in high right. school settings right right and you mentioned you said um, uh, this is for your full district can you tell me more about sort of the demographics of that district um, sure we well we are um, pretty affluent district we have probably about. 10 to 13 percent um, free and reduced lunch. Um, most of our parents, not all though, but most of our parents are very, um, 
very committed to the education of their students. They are prof- they work in professional careers. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, is that yeah, enough? Or you, you yeah, well, yeah, that gives me a good sense. Um, the because there are so many different models when it comes to innovation, right? And so you know, they're here in the Denver area, for example. There's a, a network of schools called the Denver Center for International Studies, which um, scored higher than most schools in the state, actually, in terms of standardized uh, exams in the state. Um, they're definitely much more of an inner city network, but they are Asia Society schools, and um, that would certainly be a network that I would encourage you to take a look at if you have an interest in global innovation in particular. Um, but the majority of the ISSN or Asia Society schools are um, are inner city schools. Um, not all of them. There are a couple that are not um, that are larger, comprehensive schools in more um, suburban areas. Um, another, I think, to be honest with you, in terms of just really innovative practice, one of the high schools that I've been the most impressed with is um, called Mount Vernon Presbyterian School. Uh, it is located in Atlanta, Georgia, and it, it is a private school um, with the um, Presbyterian uh, affiliation. Um, they are doing some really extraordinary work, and they're doing it from nursery through 12th grade, but the high school, I think, has been able to take it to the to the ninth degree, if you will. Um, they do a lot of things around innovation. They have these things called passion projects and I projects, and they have a very creative schedule that allows students to collaborate um, with different teachers at different times of day. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, they're doing some really extraordinary work. They've, they've done a lot with design thinking. They're still in their infancy around project-based learning, but are now in, uh, going into their second year uh, implementing project-based learning as well. Um, what I like about them is that rather than just marrying one strategy, they're collecting lots and lots of strategies. Um, so, uh, And they have somebody who's in, in, who is basically the director of design and innovation at each division. Um, so there's a very intentional effort to increase innovation um, at all three divisions. Um, so that would be one that I think is just a really great, great example of a private school um, doing some pretty extraordinary work. Wow, I'm, I'm super interested. I'll have to reach out to them because I'm trying one of our um, big tackles for this school year is to find a more creative schedule because that mm-hmm. is often what kind of pigeonholes us into a lot of things. But I, I just know there's lots of good examples out there. It's just a matter of finding them and, and tweaking it for our own situation. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Well, and I, the other one that I might recommend would be the school that I graduated from, which is a public alternative school here in Colorado in Jefferson County. Again, it's the Open Living School. Um, in, it's not the newest on the block, but it's also, it is one of the oldest. It was the second alternative public in the country um, with an experiential focus. And um, it's really, in a lot of ways, it's the beginning of the expeditionary learning movement, which has been very successful as well. Um, so yeah, that might be another, that might be another area to go in. They're certainly dealing with all the same, you know, standardized exams and things like that, that you guys are, um, which would be different at Mount Vernon. They're not necessarily dealing with as many of those standardized accountability structures. Um, so there might be some interesting things to learn from them in terms of what they've, you know, what they've experienced and, and how they've navigated it. Um, since they've been around since 1970, in a lot of ways, I feel like they might they might be able to offer more than some of these newer schools would in terms of the longevity of innovative practices. Right. Absolutely. Very cool. Okay. So last question for you. Sure. Um, you mentioned your book. And can you tell us just a little bit more about that? Give us a title. Tell us when it's coming out. I would love to. Um, so it has only a working title right now. There's oh. a very high chance that they will change the title at some point uh, in the next few months. But the working title is Meeting in the Middle, Humanizing the World Through Global Partnerships. Ooh, I like um, it. I hope they don't yeah. change it. <laughs> I know, me too. But there's, there's a little confusion among um, some of the reviewers about what meaning, meeting in the middle means and whether the reader would know that before buying the book. You know uh, what I mean? Like, like somebody might think it's for middle school teachers? Yeah, right? it could be for middle school teachers. Um, one of the reviewers uh, uh, in the early reviews said that they, they wondered where the middle was as though it was a tangible place. Okay. So we'll see. We'll see. And we may end up with something that brings in the word global education or something just for the sake of, you know, the reader understanding what it's about. Right. Um, 
but basically what I'm trying to do, and it's going to be published by uh, Solution Tree Press. It should be out in 2017, but I can't tell you more because this is my very first book. So it's my first time going through this process. Um, so I don't really know how long it will take exactly. But sure. basically what I'm trying to do through the book is to offer teachers a, a couple of things. One is just sort of the basic um, how to do it. How, how do you find a global partner? How do you develop a collaborative project with another classroom? How do you navigate the, the challenges of language differences and time zones and technologies and, and different curriculum and all of those things to build something that's meaningful um, for your students? Um, so that's part of it is just the basic how to. Part of it also is my concern around some equity challenges that I see within global education. Okay. And by that, what I mean is not so much equity of access to global, so much as equity of experience when we build partnerships. So what I notice is a lot of teachers in North America coming up with a whole project idea and then looking for a partner to help them fulfill it, rather than coming to the table ready to hear the needs of the other teacher as well. Right. That makes sense. Um, and so what it does is, unfortunately, it, it actually exacerbates some of the old imperialist structures that we have globally, right, where the U.S. teacher is telling the teacher in Sierra Leone or um, Egypt or wherever it might be, you know, here's what I need from you, as opposed to, so what do you teach? And where does our curriculum intersect? And what might we do together? And what do we have in common? You know, so a lot of the book is really about building the partnerships with that equity in mind, and how to, you know, really trying to encourage teachers to to build from the from the bottom up with their partners in a way that makes sure that um, there's something meaningful happening for students on all sides. Yeah, uh, okay, cool. Sure. Very yeah. cool. I can't wait for that. Yeah, and it also includes a lot of stories and testimonies from teachers and students about their experiences doing partnerships, uh, not just in North America, but from other parts of the world as well, just to kind of give educators that little extra inspiration of, you know, here's how it impacts a young person's life, and um, here's how educators who have made the effort feel about having done so, um, to just kind of, create, you know, helps to create that compelling argument for why this is worth the work, because it is extra work, certainly. Yeah, wow. Okay, so Jennifer, how can people find you and connect with you um, if they want to know more? Absolutely. Well, my, my website is Principled Learning Strategies. That would be principled as in to have principles, not to be one like you. <laughs> but <laughs> Not a pal. <laughs> uh, exactly. PrincipledLearning.org is the website address. Um, all of my writing is posted there, at least everything that within copyright I'm allowed to share is there. Um, my blog is there. Um, lots of recordings of webinars and things like that as well. So there's a lot of open source material even right on the website that people can explore. Um, and then, of course, there's a way to contact me through the website as well. Um, and I certainly encourage schools to do that. Okay, very cool. Jennifer, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation because so many things that we're thinking about here in Pittsburgh, um, you have commented on. So it's just amazing how many different people I connect with who are really, you know, trying for many of the similar, many of the same things. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an exciting time. I, I feel like we're in a turning point in education, and I almost wonder whether things had to get as bad as possible before they could get better. Um, and I'm not trying to make a political statement with that, but I think there may be a political statement to be made with that in general, too, that we may be in the storm uh, that will uh, lead to something a whole lot better for everybody. So uh, it was a pleasure for me as well. I really enjoyed the conversation, and if there's anything I can do to support your efforts in Pittsburgh, I hope you'll reach out. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for listening in on the Pittsburgh Gal Principal Podcast. I am always excited to connect with women in education, learn how they are balancing work and home, as well as challenging the status quo about what it means to be a successful woman. My podcast is all about elevating the voices of women, so please share these stories with your friends and your colleagues. Find me on Twitter at eclair underscore ahs. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.